At long last, the battle has ended. And thus, Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. Hello, it's the eve of Ghana's 56th independence and I have been blessed with the amazing opportunity to be sat here with Haiti Professor Kweku, who does so well for himself at the Ghanaian High Commission in London and I have to let you know we are in for a treat today. Um, I, I just can't say any more, we just have to have this conversation. Thank you so much sir for blessing us with the opportunity. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Um, what has independence come to mean for you as an individual? Um, well, 1957, 6th of March, I think I was turning seven, not quite seven. Um, the, we, I was in primary school, third grade. Uh, most of us had no idea what independence meant. We had been told that we were going to be independent from British colonial rule, and um, whatever that meant, we, you know, uh, I don't think there, there were that many seven-year-olds in Ghana who really understood what independence meant. Uh, we, I do remember that uh, on that day we were given uh, plastic cups with the Queen's, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II's photograph on it. And I do remember that my cup had number seven. Uh, you know, all the cups were numbered, uh, it had number seven uh, on it. And uh, the number seven was quite significant because you know, around that time the, the UK had uh, a football player, Sir Stanley Matthews who had uh, who wore number seven jersey he had come to the Gold Coast at the time to play and everybody was excited about uh, his number seven jersey uh, he was at that time the world's best footballer so the fact that I, my cup was number seven meant something and uh, either I was uh, you know the cup was signifying the relevance of uh, say Stalimatis or it was signifying something else but the fact that it was seven was very significant uh, to us in Chi independence meant Fahudi free uh, free from colonial rule free from uh, European rule and uh, we felt that uh, once Europeans left uh, you know all our problems will be solved educational systems were going to be expanded healthcare was going to be expanded food was going to be plentiful and uh, the areas where we were forbidden from, from going. In my hometown, for instance, Chebi, we had uh, places called Obrodikrum, a European town, uh, where most of us were prevented from going. Uh, there were signs out there saying, stay out of this area. There were dogs out there. There were all kinds of uh, uh, British guards. Uh, you know, so from that time on, we were told that uh, we could go there. They had a lot of apples, oranges, name it, all kinds of fruits that we were quite interested in, but were forbidden from, from entering those areas. So to us, the literary independence meant freedom to go and take as much of these oranges as possible because they were our property. We, we really did not envisage the kinds of problems that we will be facing after, after independence. But you know, the, the Ghana's independence is closely linked with the activities of our first president, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And he articulated the purpose and objectives of independence. But because we're so young, we really didn't quite understand it. I did not understand these things until maybe I got to the university. 
and at the university I really came to appreciate what uh, Nkoma meant. Because as you know, in 1945 he had been, he was here in the UK, he had participated in the Manchester Conference on Pan-Africanism, he had articulated the objectives of uh, Pan-Africanism and he felt that uh, in order to really embark on the cause of Pan-Africanism to ultimately accomplish the objectives of a united Africa, we have to be independent, we have to free ourselves from colonial rule. So he had published one of his first books, The Struggle for Colonial Freedom. And in there he had articulated why and how we needed to be independent. So once he got back to Ghana in 1947, uh, began organizing uh, towards the self-government. And uh, if you remember that, there was a huge debate between him and the other groups, the intelligentsia, who were at, uh, agree for self-government in the shortest possible time, as opposed to self-government now. So in 1949, when he formed the Convention People's Party, uh, started speeding up the process of attaining self-government, uh, the nation got excited. But the culmination of it was on the 6th of March 1957, when he made several significant statements, sent a message to the world that one, we were seeking independence because as a people, we had a right to manage or mismanage our own affairs. From now on, there is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing the whole of us. We are going to demonstrate to the world, to the other nations, young as we are, that we are prepared to lay our own foundation. We are going to see that we create our own African personality and identity. And we again, we dedicate ourselves, not only in the struggle to emancipate other territories in Africa, uh, the world did not pay that much attention to it. He also proceeded to say, to declare, that at that particular time, we needed to stop behaving like a colonial people. We needed to embark on a cause of changing our personality into what he described as the African personality. A proud Africans who were going to build the first free country as Marcus Garvey had wanted to do but could not succeed. So he was very proud to tell the world that today this former colony of Britain, referred to as the Cold Coast, was free forever. But he did not stop there. He went ahead to proclaim. Our independence is meaningless unless it lifts up the total rebellion of the African continent. <laughs> that Ghana's independence was not just for Ghanaians, and it wasn't an end in itself. It was a means to an end. And that end was the total liberation of the African continent. And that's how he summed it, that the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. He did not just say it and leave it there, as some politicians would do. He said it. He lived it, he operationalized it, he put it into practice by supporting the liberation movements on the continent. You remember that uh, the following year, in 1958, he had called a Pan-African Congress in Ghana. Um, and had, at the end of the year, you know, initially he started with governments inviting the uh, independent state of Africa for a meeting in Accra. And uh, towards the end of the year, I think it was December, he invited the peoples. He made a distinction between governments and peoples of Africa. He invited the peoples where all the leaders of the liberation movements at the time, MPLA, ANC, Frelimo, to come to Ghana to dialogue and chart a course for the total liberation of Africa. And you see, he also went further to devote a huge chunk of Ghana's resources both human, material, and financial, to assisting the liberation movements on the continent at the time. Uh, those liberation movements that were fighting Portuguese colonial rule in Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Verde, also fighting the uh, minority, illegal minority regime in Rhodesia headed by Jan Smith, and also paid a lot of, lot of attention to assisting the African National Congress, uh, Nelson Mandela, to a large extent, 
Kare Malawi at the time, Dr. Hastings Kamuzu Banda and others were invited to come and live in Ghana. So there, there, there was hardly any uh, liberator of a leader of a liberation movement who did not live in Ghana or who did not hold a Ghanaian passport. Because at that particular time, these individuals were not allowed to hold the, they, they were outcasts. They had been, been declared illegal in their own country. Joshua Nkomo, Robert Mugabe, and as you know, Mugabe even ended up marrying a Ghanaian. So he opened the doors of Ghana to the former colonial territories of Africa. Uh, you remember that in 1958, when Guinea uh, declared independence of France, uh, Nkrumah lent Guinea about 10 million pounds, uh, followed by Mali under President Modi Bokita. He went ahead and again lent uh, Mali a similar amount of money uh, after the French had removed just about everything they brought to, uh, to those countries. So that was the practicalization of Nkrumah's liberation uh, ideology in, in Ghana, so uh, in, in the rest of Africa. So to uh, a large extent, he saw Ghana as a platform. Ghana had become independent. That objective had been accomplished. Now we needed to extend it. Because he, he felt that Ghana, with a population of just about 4 million people, with a, a, a territorial size, not to him, big enough to be economically viable, had to uh, be incorporated into a larger African uh, a government, a continental African government, he, because he felt that uh, the progressive countries at the time, the countries that had become viable, the countries that were doing uh, very well economically, uh, the United States, the Soviet Union, uh, had the size and the population uh, to match with it. They had clouded the international system. So he, he really felt that Africa needed to match that by coming together. Uh, based on our historical sad historical uh, experiences, we had been, uh, we had experienced slavery, we had been colonized, and we continue to be exploited. But one of the things that we learned from Kwame Nkrumah is that whatever he thought, he translated it into writing, and he translated it from writing into practice. So by 1963-64, he had worked on this document, Africa Must Unite, where he had made the political, social, and economic arguments for United African, uh, African government. And uh, from that time on, by 1965, he had also seen the pitfalls of independence, that uh, this flag independence, this national anthem independence, this uh, national pledge independence wasn't enough. You had driven the, colonial, the colonialists out of the uh, political door, and they were coming back through the economic window. And he coined the term neocolonialism, and he, that also culminated in his publication of a book, Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism, which created a lot of problems uh, for the United States, for, for, for instance. That uh, you remember that around that time when he decided to embark on a trip to, to Hanoi and had asked President Johnson to suspend bombing and whatever, uh, President Johnson's response was that uh, they could not guarantee his safety and security. And it was mainly because the United States had opposed to the publication and the release of uh, new colonialism, the last stage of imperialism. So uh, in a nutshell, that was how uh, independence uh, was attained. It wasn't just for Ghanaians, it was for the entire African, uh, African, African race. And uh, when Kwame Nkrumah talked about African race, he wasn't just referring to the parochial Africans on the African continent. He extended it to our brothers and sisters in the diaspora.